how it appears in Ohid Khachamani in Macha. In a Twila Zephyr, Ate, Warren Gaigo, and Mitch walking up. My mother is Twila Zephyr, and my father is my father is I was uh, raised by wasn't raised by my biological father but was raised by uh, Warren Gallego and my uh, biological father is Mitch Wakian. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about war trauma and for you to understand. Oh, excuse me. Um, I want to. We probably have some veterans in here. Just because our uh, native peoples are have that warrior spirit, so I want to just uh, ask for forgiveness for speaking in front of you. Uh, but I have, I believe, I have something important to say to help the people, and also um, this is a very emotional topic for me because. Uh, like it says, if you read the program, I am a veteran of Afghanistan, U.S. Army, and I served as a medic over there in 2004, 2005, honorably discharged in 2006. But no one can really understand what war is like. You might have some veterans in your family and um, when they have come back from combat, they weren't the same. And they don't want to talk about it because nobody can truly understand uh, what it's like to be there and to see the things that they've seen. Unless you were there beside them or unless you experienced something similar. And we all have our veterans all have our, our wars, and the more recent one, you know, the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, um, Desert Storm, Vietnam, um, where else were we before that? You know, Korea, World War One, World War Two. All these wars were were horrific to the veteran, to the people, to the warriors that were in them. And they may have done things that they're never going to talk about again. And because when you're in war, um, it's chaos. When you're in firefights, it's chaos. Um, things happen that you don't have control over. You might have accidentally killed a woman and her family and her children. You're never going to talk about that, most likely but it's going to eat you up for, you, for probably the rest of your life. So as a veteran, um, I'm just going to try to help you visualize what we go through. And I have some graphic pictures here. I'm going to give you a heads up. So if you have a weak stomach, uh, you're not going to want to see those. I'll have a warning up before I show those. But that's just a little uh, heads up because I know some people might not want to see that. But for you to understand where the veterans are coming from, you have to, at the very least, understand these where these pictures come from. And I was a photographer of these pictures. But natives, Native Americans, make up you know approximately one percent of the U.S. population. And, we're approximately 4% of the military population, the highest of any race per capita in the military. And it's because of the warrior spirit. This here is uh, Lekshi Anthony Bush, Ugalala Lakota Vietnam veteran. I found this online, <laughs> Google. But the warrior spirit, we have it no matter what uh, war, what time period it was. World War I, World War II, our people answered the call to go to war. 
And uh, you know, there's there's political reasons why we shouldn't be fighting for this country that did this to us and that to us. But when it when it comes to war, it's and you have that warrior spirit inside you, you answer the call. And it really doesn't uh, matter or seem to matter to to individuals like myself what those political beliefs are. And as a young man, I had that, that in me that I was never again going to serve in the U.S. military. But I honored and I loved the stories of our warriors. So I, I listened to them, I read about them, and, and probably, I remember the first time a recruiter called me, I was about 11th grade, and I was like, no, I'm not going to join the military. And that was it. Went to college in Ohio. And I started thinking about ROTC, and I was thinking about the Air Force. Almost joined the Air Force ROTC, went to one class. I was too busy as a college student, so I didn't, I didn't see it fitting into my schedule, so I didn't do it. Well, a couple years passed, and I, um, I graduated. Today, now this is... Uh, these are my children. I just wanted to kind of set a tone in where I'm at today. Now, these are my children. I have uh, five, six, one on the way, I think. <laughs> you know, just lose count after a while. But, <laughs> but uh, my wife has a couple, too, and we have, we're going to have eight together. February, we'll, our new one will be, along, be coming along. But uh, this is me today. This is another picture, just me and my wife. <laughs> now, as a young man or a young boy, this isn't me, this is my son a few years ago. I couldn't find a, a boyhood picture of myself. But uh, as a young boy, I would read about our warriors, and I would hear the stories, as I'll say, and I admired them. Uh, I, I wanted to be like them. Their, their values, their live for the people first. Feed, your, feed the people first before you feed yourself. Those values, uh, you know, to die naked as a warrior, it's, it's all honorable to me, and I, I loved hearing about it, and I loved learning about it. So all those stories, uh, Grand, Grandpa Adalbert is up here. He was a World War II veteran and served in Normandy, France on D-Day. He was one of those guys that got off the boats you know, that you saw in Saving Private Ryan. And he told me a little bit about it. But uh, about all I remember from him talking to me was the ocean was red with blood. And I asked him then, you know, what, what would you say if I told you I was going to join the military? He said, oh, it's your life. <laughs> I didn't understand what that meant at the time. I thought it was like, you know, it's my life, I can do what I want. But it, I think he was saying it's your life, your life to give, if you want. Now, you know, we fast forward, and uh, time passed, I decided... Excuse me, I'm going to apologize now because I'm going to cry. <laughs> this is hard for me to talk about. Before I joined the military, um, it was about 2002 or so, and I had this dream. I went to a, what was it, group hypnosis. I was at a public library and I went to this group hypnosis and I, was, I had this dream in there and I was trying to figure it out. But in this dream, uh, this woman told us, she said, imagine yourself in your past life and she didn't put no images in our head, but what did you look like? What did you see? What are you seeing? And I saw myself, uh, well, she said, how did you die? And I saw myself laying on the battlefield. Uh, U.S. cavalry soldiers dead around me. 
And then she said, picture yourself giving yourself a gift. What do you give? And I sat up from that dead position and handed myself a big ball of light. And I took it. I didn't know what it was, but I took it. And I thought about that dream for a long time. I thought, you know, am I supposed to be in the military? Is it because I always admired the warriors that I want to be? Warrior. So uh, about that time, the second Iraq war was, was starting up. And I think it was about two weeks before it started, I shipped out to basic training. And before I left, I had everything planned. I talked with uh, my wife at the time, Alicia, a good soldier, and discussed with her, this is how I want to be buried. Uh, I want to be, you know, I don't remember the details now, but I talked with her about it. And I wasn't going for the benefits, now, those were a plus, but I was going to go to war because I knew the U.S. was about to go to war. I wanted that war experience. I wanted to be the old man that could talk about war and have that experience in my life. So those were my reasons. And part of that comes from a uh, long time ago when the, the Europeans came and they took our buffalo away from us and they took our uh, put us on reservations, you know, we we had manhood ceremonies then that helped us become men and I wasn't able to go through those traditional ceremonies. So part of becoming a man to me was going to war. So I made that decision. That was me, or this is me, about a hundred pounds ago. 2004, April 2004, April 2005, I was in Afghanistan. Um, I was a medic, and I never hurt anybody, I never shot at anybody, uh, I only helped people. Um, the good side, you know, our side, their side, everybody in between. Civilians, Afghani civilians, we had a lot of injuries from uh, landmines because Afghanistan was uh, littered with landmines from the Russians in the 1980s when they were having their war over there. So farmers would be farming their land and they would step on a landmine. So we would get those guys. I was in forward operating base Salerno, about five miles from Pakistan, Afghanistan border, on the Afghanistan site in the Hindu Kush mountains. And that's where, um, I guess, our, our, our base was. I was with Charlie Company 725 Medical Support. So we were the furthest forward surgical hospital in the combat zone. Anybody got hurt in Pakistan, around us, they came through us first. Sometimes what I did was volunteer to go out with the flight medics and pick up patients. We weren't a flight medic unit, but they needed help, and we wanted to help. So we jumped in and we would go. I probably only went on about six missions with them. But uh, other, our main duties were to bring patients from the front gate of our base to the hospital, which was just a tent. And it was like an octagon tent at the time when we first got there. That was our emergency room. But we had doctors, we had plastic surgeons and all, so they could do just about anything there. Most of the time they just cut off limbs because there's not much they could do in, in uh, that environment. But some other things we did was bring patients from the flight, uh, the flight line, the medevacs. They would come in and we would pick them up in the Humvee ambulances. That one there, that one there is one of the ones I drove. I think I'm, I'm outside the base, right there. Those guys would hang out, hang out outside the base. I don't know what they're doing there, but um, sometimes we would go and give them medical treatment. Uh, we get training from our physicians, assistant, our doctors, and they trained us up on how to do just about everything: stitches, uh, 
venous cut downs, you know, uh, anything. We gave meds. Uh, what did we do? I gave jugular IVs, sternum <laughs> IVs, <laughs> just all sorts of stuff. We would practice. We would practice with the, with the rangers, the ranger medics, and they were crazier than us. So they would help us or show us how to do these things. But the whole reason why I'm, I'm giving you this backstory is because you have to understand the things that some of us veterans go through. I've never heard anybody in war, but there are veterans who have, and that. I know that bothers them because the things I've seen bother me. I slept with these guys in a tent, probably five feet from our uh, our cooler. We kept our KIAs in, our killed in actions. Yeah, it wasn't always full, but it was there, and sometimes there's people in it. Just a picture of me and a boy. The boy is standing outside our base and pulled him aside and said, hey, let's take a picture. I don't know if you can understand me, but he saw a camera, so you probably know what I was doing. But uh, those are the new Kush Mountains behind us. Those are some of my patients that would bring from the front gate to the base. Uh, that boy, I believe, just had a, a deformity. I'm not sure if it was a scar or something, but it was connected like his jaw to his neck. So they were trying to help him maybe loosen it up or something. But uh, there's an Afghan National Army soldier on the left, and this individual looks like he has a sick daughter. And if you've ever seen those National Geographic pictures, they have some beautiful blue eyes over there. I don't know where that comes from, but um, there's one. I had this patient, and he was. He's coming in. He's an old man. He's like, oh, my back hurts. My back hurts. And through an interpreter, I was, and what's wrong with you? What, what happened? Why does your back hurt? Oh, yeah, I hurt my back about 20 years ago. And I'm not sure I can do it now, but you know what? What happened 20 years ago? How can I do it? I was a prisoner of war in the, in the Russian prison. Like, whoa! <laughs> you know, this it was a living piece of history in front of me because I only read about the war. And he was, you know, he was telling me how they beat him up and they tortured him and, and uh, how, I don't know what they did to his back, but it was probably from the beatings that they gave him. So these are some of the stories that were coming from there. And we dealt with a lot of dead people. Um, if you can think about it from a movie, what you saw and, you know, what happens in war, we probably dealt with it. Um, blown off arms, legs, landmines, uh, faces destroyed from grenades, uh, AK-47 rounds do some major damage to bones. Every one that I ever took care of that was shot in an arm or leg, the doctors cut off their arm or leg because the AK-47 round, the 7.62 by 39 is what it is caliber will just shatter your bones. The 223 rounds that the military, the US military uses, they bounce around. And they'll kill you because they bounce around. But uh, those AK-47 rounds will do some damage and I'm gonna show you some pictures. So you're gonna see a little bit about of that. This was a helicopter that crashed and I had the luxury of being on the ground for this. And there were 16 or 15 soldiers, sailors, Marines on board. They were doing a, it was unnecessary is what it was. It was, a, they were basically flying around for some general that was coming to base. And something happened, the pilot lost control. They're, I think they were flying back with the earth, which is just low to the, to the earth. And uh, something happened, pilot lost control. The helicopter hit the ground. He couldn't regain control, and 
they brought this back. This was after they brought it back from wherever it crashed and they put it on our base and I got this picture. But I was on the ground when this happened and we were in a class actually doing training with the ranger medics that I was talking about. And they just said, come back to the hospital. So we were running, we didn't know what was going on. And all of a sudden they're bringing people off the medevacs. And what happened, what happened? We have one patient in front of us and he's moaning and groaning. And What happened, me and uh, one of my other medic friends, he wouldn't tell us what happened, he was too busy screaming. And uh, he just said, I, I got effing folded in half. And I was like, what? You know, we didn't know that this, this is where he came from yet. But then we started realizing there was more coming and more coming and more coming. And I'm like, oh, you know, what do we do? Uh, we need a C spine. We need to do, you know, we, all the training started coming back to us. But we were fortunate that day. We only lost one. 15 crashed in a helicopter and we lost one. And I'm going to tell you a little story about this. And there's a, there's a correlation of this and that dream that I told you about. In that dream uh, where they gave me the ball of light, after I got out of the military, I finally asked about that in ceremony and asked for an interpretation with uh, Ate Rick, two dogs. And what they told me was uh, that ball of light was your spirit, or that man was your spirit. He was giving you the gift of life. He said, because you're going to die over there. He said, you're going to die in that helicopter crash. And I wasn't ever asked to fly with these guys, but if I was asked, I would have been on there because I was, that's just the kind of guy I was. I was, um, you know, just go, let's do it. And uh, I think everybody who, who knows me <laughs> in here knows that's still how I am, even at Sundance and uh, everywhere else. Kind of called upon to do this to the last minute, <laughs> and here I am. But that's just my personality. Those are some more of our medic friends. Uh, the little woman in the bottom was my sergeant. The one I'm standing next to is uh, our physician assistant. She trained us up on just about everything we needed to know. Uh, great woman. I still keep in contact with her thanks to Facebook. That's one thing Facebook's good for. This is my warning. I want to put some little birds up there because just to set the tone. The next, the next few photos get a little bit of graph, graphic. I started off a little bit light. I didn't include the worst photos because uh, well, I couldn't find them. But um, this is a little bit. And war is war, no matter what time you're in. And the reason why I say that because everybody should know this one. Wounded Knee, and the survivors of Wounded Knee have got PTSD, they have war trauma, <coughs> and because of um, reservations, the government, our men at one time went through ceremonies when they came back from battle, every battle. You know, whether that's uh, on blood show, Sundance, there was different certain things they did there in those ceremonies. Because war and trauma was war and trauma two, three hundred years ago, it still is. Nothing's changed. You know, maybe uh, it, it was a little more gruesome back then, but I think it could be. It's just not talked about now because it's taboo. Uh, there's still some horrific things going on over there with our soldiers. Our, uh, some stories that we hear as, as soldiers inside the military and you hear special forces talk about things. Because we were the hospital they came to, so they would talk. And we would hear that they did this or that to this person. You know, uh, and President Bush at the time was saying, we don't torture, and we're sitting listening to these special forces guys saying, yeah, we broke his legs. Yeah, we broke his feet. You know, so these 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 things happen. Politicians are politicians, and war trauma is 
is uh, the same now as it was 300 years ago, 500 years ago, or 1,000 years ago. The only difference now is we don't have or we don't practice as much uh, the spiritual ways as we did back then. We never hear about stories where a veteran or a, a somebody, a warrior who has fought in a war and killed himself because he was depressed 200 years ago, yeah, 300 years ago. They lived closer to prayer. And everything I'm talking to you about, I have learned from uh, the past eight years that I've been out. I've been seeking healing from our ceremonies. Nothing has helped me more than our ceremonies. I've gone through the VA. I've gone through uh, even some odd stuff that I heard about from friends. I can't remember what it's called. Emotion code. And I don't know if it worked, but it sent me down into a a deep depression. Maybe it was because some feelings came out with it. I, I don't know. But it set me about the lowest point of, of my life or the second lowest point of my life. And I actually contemplated suicide at the time. So I, I've, go, I go, I've gone through the treatments. You know, uh, I haven't gone through the PTSD inpatient clinic with the VA because in my eight years of going to the VA, it's all the same. They throw meds at you. You, know, you walk in and you talk to your doctor. And you, you tell your doctor, hey, Doc, I, uh, I'm having nightmares. Uh, I can't sleep. Uh, something's bothering me at night. Voices are bothering me. And uh, as Native peoples, those voices, we're not, we're not schizophrenic. Yeah, with those voices to native people are ghosts. And they come, and many of them follow you back from war. Which is why these ceremonies I'm going to kind of briefly uh, talk to you about are done. Because a lot, I, I have noticed that a lot of this trauma, uh, a lot of the after effects of war that is known as PTSD, was caused by these ghosts. And I'm really self-analytical. Always was. Uh, when I was a baseball player, when I was 12 years old, I really analyzed how I swung that. I was really self-analytical and still am. So I really feel when my emotions are changing, um, when there's something around me, I can feel, I can feel it. So, when these things come around, you know, and a long time ago we had ceremonies that uh, we, all of our warriors did. It wasn't a question. It just, it was our people, it was our way of life. And they went through these ceremonies and treatment was done for after war. Prior to war, prior to war, there were certain things done. And there, we didn't wear war paint, or paint just to wear war paint. It meant something. These are just a few uh, photos I wanted to share with you because PTSD, war, trauma is trauma. No matter what era you're in, Looks like an AK-47 round. Maybe went through his leg. I can't remember. I took that photo. That was after we carried him to the docks, and then we put him on the table in front of the docks, and then we can step back, and I don't know what comes over you, what, what goes through your mind at that time, but he's like, I'm going to take a picture of this. You know, this uh, war injury. Um, you're not thinking right. But I, but I took a lot of photos and think I lost a lot of them. I don't know where they went, but I'm glad I did because I don't want to be seeing all that. It looks like a AK-47 round they pulled out of his arm. I just had him hold it because it was pretty cool. No, it was in his belly. 
I remember that. It was in his belly. They pulled it out of his belly. I just say, hey, can you hold it for me? I'll take a picture. This is kind of cool. I don't know what. I don't know what was going through our head at the time. Exit wound. You can see the deformity in his arm. The bone shattered. Uh, droops down. Here too. I remember his arm was flopping around. So. Some of the PTSD worse, the symptoms of PTSD from war veterans. Um, negative changes in the beliefs and feelings. You stay away from relationships, you stay away from people. Uh, they annoy you, and you really don't have any tolerance for stupidity or what you perceive to be stupid, stupid behavior or uh, unnecessary behavior. Uh, Depression contributes to a lot of this. You don't, you, know, you don't have a lot of positive feelings. Everything is is negative. You, everybody's out to hurt you, so you're always on guard. Listen, I usually carry two knives on me, and I couldn't find them this morning, which is probably good because I don't know. <laughs> you know, dressed up, I'm not. Shouldn't, probably shouldn't be having a knife on me, but. I usually carry two knives on me because it makes me feel safe. Because I could at least do something. And it's not, you know, to hurt random people, it's to hurt anybody who's trying to hurt me because of the things we've seen. Uh, I don't imagine I'll ever change. Maybe I'll put the knives away, but maybe not. Paranoia. And it kind of goes back to those ghosts that I was talking about. They bother you, and they they drive you insane. They they have that power to do that to the human mind, and they'll drive you insane. Um, I used to be standing somewhere, and I would get the feeling that somebody was coming up behind me, and somebody was going to stab me in the back. So if I was doing dishes, and I would all of a sudden I'd be like, I would just cringe because. I had the image in my mind that somebody was coming up from behind me and going to stab me in the back. But I knew, I knew it wasn't real, so I never told anybody. And I never told my doc. Uh, I think I told my wife once. But if anybody saw me, they might have wondered what I was doing. But that's what was going through my head. Going around corners, walking even out of here. I might, especially if it's you know in my dark house, if we just got home, I went into my house first and I searched the house to make sure no one was in there. And I would walk around with my arms up, ready to protect myself. And that's, you know, paranoia from the things we've experienced in war. It's all difficult. Flashbacks. I was fortunate enough to never have these. I never almost got stabbed over there, so I don't know where these images are coming from. Probably the ghosts. And if you could get rid of those, in a Lakota beliefs, if you know those ghosts, like I said, they'll drive you nuts. And I believe that's what they were trying to do to me. Depression. Two very low points in my life. Every year, it's like a roller coaster. Usually about winter. I've been good this, this winter. I don't know why. Maybe because I moved home. I was living on the other side of the state. But I moved home and I moved closer, closer to ceremony. Closer to Unipi. And But the years on the other side of the state, when I was away from the ceremonies, I had about the lowest times of my life. So these ceremonies help and there's something to it. And what exactly that is, I don't know. So... Um, Better person to talk to about the what exactly happens. Maybe he doesn't know. I don't know. But be some, one of the spiritual leaders, or I would go to my uh, Ate Rick. Any situations, it's you. You avoid any 
bad situations, I mean, the, B, the BS, I wouldn't call it. Somebody comes at me with false accusations, I'm going to walk away from it just because I've been through worse in my life and this is nothing. But then I learn that while I'm ignoring them, they're getting madder and madder and madder. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're accusing you of, you know, of trying to blow up something or something horrible like molesting. You know, just because you're ignoring them. So from ignoring, from making that mistake of ignoring the problem, I've learned to confront the problem right head on and just give them all the evidence, all the truth, my side of the story, if they have some fault, some accusations towards me. And that's helped, I've noticed. You know, because the PTSD has taught me to say, F you, leave me alone. That's BS. And I would just walk away. Because anything you can throw at me, I've, sur I've survived worse. Even if I went to prison, I've survived worse. I got meals in there. I got a bed. You know, so I, I've, I've lived through a, a lot. And that's the mentality that just about every war veteran has. I've survived worse, so no matter what you throw at me, I can handle it. Trouble concentrating. Nightmares. Nightmares. Um, again, ghosts. I've noticed when I've had nightmares, there were voices. I, I had that creepy feeling in my house. There's somebody in here watching me. And I would pay real close attention because I'm, like I was saying, I'm a real self-analytical and everything around me too. So I would listen to, to it. I would see them. I would hear them. And then I could hear them talking. And as I'm trying to sleep, I'd hear voices. Um, as you have, you know, you're in that point between sleep, awake, they would wake me up and they wouldn't let me sleep. And they would yell at me. And it's, if you ever had somebody yell your name or something whenever you're half asleep and you wake up, that's kind of what it's like. Except for they don't always just yell your name, they just yell some profanity or, or something. And that is always contributed to ghosts. And that's what I learned from dealing with them. It come it came to a point where it got so bad I couldn't sleep. I started feeling my chanupa, my pipe, and putting it in the bed next to me if uh, I, if I was alone. Or I I learned at a young age that the eagle feather makes our minds strong. So I would tie those feathers on my braids or put it in my hair. Usually I put it in my braids and I would go to sleep and they would leave me alone. Um, the sage, you know, I've learned the, le the lessons from Monte Rick about sage and how it helps. So another thing I experimented with is I suck on a little bit of sage and I roll it up into a ball and stick it in my ear and I couldn't hear them. And they would, I would sleep good. So these are just some little tricks I've learned to deal with this because they're there. There's other things that can be done. You can have ceremony and, and take them away. But these little things, these, these, these uh, spirits that follow you back from war, because we dealt with a lot of dead people and there's a lot of spirits there that are left over from war because that place has been at war forever, you know, for, for hundreds of years probably. But they would follow you back and they would harass. These are just some of the things that I've done to help fight them. And maybe there's other reasons why it happens too, I don't know. I don't know everything, but I do know that the things I've experimented with, because I wanted to live, because I wanted to deal with it, and I wanted to fight them, um, I know that some of the things that I've used work, and it, I only have Everything I know, everything I've learned, everything I'm talking to you about, I've learned from Ate Rick because I grew up close to him and I grew up close to the altar and I grew, grew up close to the Chinupa. My dad, uh, Warren Gallego, has been sending me a medicine horse sundance for 
I don't know, 40 years, 39 years, I'm not sure, really. They, they don't even know. But, so I grew up around that, and I'm only 34. So everything I know, I've, I've learned from, from the altar and the grandfathers around there. So everything I'm telling you, I'm just repeating what I know, what they've taught me. Nothing, nothing of, of this is original. You know, I'm a product of, of the grandfathers of my elders. I was fortunate to have a, to grow up around a, a lot of men and to hear these stories about warriors, which is kind of what pushed me into wanting to be one. Some things that were done on my behalf and, and that I don't know if they were done for, you know, they're probably done for other veterans or Lakota Dakota veterans, not Dakota veterans. But uh, one thing that was done for me while I was away was uh, my family had ceremony for me and asked for protection for me. So they tied an eagle feather in the sweat lodge and they said, as long as it stays here, he'll return. So maybe it was because of that, you know, that my dream of, of that man giving me the gift of life, maybe he knew that this was going to happen. So he created that. So they, they, you know, they know things are unexplainable. Even trying to analyze it could drive you insane because we can't understand fully what's going on. But these are things that could be done before a veteran goes to war, or during, in my case. Um, one other thing that uh, Tayrik did was he mailed me a little chanupa, a little pipe. I don't know if he filled it, I think he said he filled it. And he said, wear it around your neck. He said his, his dad carried his pipe in war. So, but uh, I don't know what happened, I never got that pipe. But, uh, these pipes, you know, these, these sacred items, they can take care of themselves, so I'm not worried about it. It's out there somewhere, and if it's meant for me to have, it'll come to me someday. That's kind of the way I see that, and I made it home, so, so I'm okay with that. Um, even if I didn't make it home. Oh, look, I'm just going to share this one story. Uh, we were relieving, the day we were leaving Afghanistan, we were flying trying to get off the flight line in uh, C-130. Our plane couldn't get off the ground, it was too heavy. It was pretty scary, you know, we would try, you hear those engines try to pick up, and it would just drop, and drop, and you know, there's a whole bunch of trees at the end of the flight line, you're like, I don't know if we don't run into those trees. You just, you have your little window that can peek out, so we're looking out there, and, uh, wasn't sure we were going to get off the ground. We had to try a couple times, maybe two or three times, what we did. Another time, we went home. I didn't, even, I didn't go home. I didn't take leave that whole year. I was over there. I was saving it for Sundance because I was all out of leave. I needed to leave to go on Sundance after I got back. But, so I went to Uzbekistan for R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. Yeah, a base there called K2 or Karshi Kanabad or something like something along those lines. But I spent a couple weeks there watching movies, really nothing else to do, working out. And on my way back, there was this uh, my only bird, only airplane into my base was a, a uh, mail plane, white mail plane contractor. A little plane, twin engines. So I'm getting on this plane and we're flying. Well, as we're leaving the, as the, as we're, as we're leaving the tarmac, there's another little male plane across the way from me. I was just, you know, I was just looking at it, like, oh, they're leaving too. They're going somewhere, delivering mail. Well, we're flying over the mountains, and it looks like we're so close to the mountains that somebody can throw a rock at us and hit us. So I was, I was like, man, somebody just has to be standing there with an RPG or something, and shoot us down. Because there's those guys have houses on the mountains too, you know, little uh, mud adobe homes. I don't maybe that's where they put their dead. I'm not sure, but there's little houses up there. 
And uh, when I got back to my base that day, we landed safely. I learned that the other plane I was looking at crashed. They got shot down. So, I mean, that, you know, that stuff happens. There is a reason why I was thinking that. The grandfathers were there protecting me. Maybe they put me on the other plane. And it's all because of prayer, and all because of our ceremonies. It's the only reason why I'm here today. When the Akichita returns, this is what happened to me. I was given a feather. I was honored by other veterans. Uh, Ate Stan Holder fought in Vietnam, also in Wounded Knee, too. And he was a, he is an admirable man. He was uh, one of my, one of my idols as a young boy. Watch him out at Sundance do some amazing things. And I, I saw his strength in him. I saw his spirit and how strong he was. So just seeing him walk the way he walked, being a good man, um, I wanted to be like that. Not, not necessarily like him, but like that, a good warrior. And I had the honor of him tying my feather up when I got back. At that same time, when I got out the ceremony, or the Inipi, they uh, gave me wopaki, or a spiritual cleansing. From my understanding, what that is, is uh, you might have learned yesterday that you know, they wiped you down with sage, or that sage can take off that trauma, that uh, trauma residue, as Ethlene, or Tony Ethlene says. So, you know, you make your offerings to the grandfathers for this. They come in and they doctor you. And when you come out, they wipe you down with sage. And Ate Stan Holder was the one who wiped me down. And also, I burned all my military gear. I had another year to go, but I was just going to buy new stuff. I don't want that. I wore those four pairs of uniforms for a year and carried a lot of dead people with them. And my boots, too, and I didn't want that. I didn't want to keep those. Um, so burning all that represents starting over, starting a new life, being purified. So that's what I did. I yeah, made the offerings, and, and we did all that in the Wolpaking thing. And uh, there's always, anytime you do something, anytime you ask for help, you always want to give Wolpila, give thanks. So that's always a part of the ceremony. There's other ceremonies that can be done. And if uh, Akichito killed somebody in war, uh, he can have his hands wiped of that blood by a spiritual leader or an uh, interpreter of the sacred, sacred the Wakanyeska. And as uh, we all know, or we, some of us should know that that pipe, you know, we're not supposed to touch that pipe but if we have bad thoughts or if we've done bad things in our life. And having your hands purified and your hands wiped of that blood that from killing um, when it was necessary, uh, you have that, you're able to pick that pipe up again because you've been wiped of that spiritual residue. And with coming, you know, with, we see a lot of young people today pick up a pipe and they still continue to be crazy young people. Um, part of being a pipe carrier is being a good person and striving to be a good person every single day. And I learned that as a young, you know, as a young man, mostly from the stories I was telling you about. So that's something I try to do. And it's always a struggle because life's hard. But if we keep trying and we keep standing back up when we fall down, we're going to get there someday. They're in Sundance. I, I've been Sundancing now for 13 years. I Sundance at Medicine Horse Sundance and uh, Knife Chief Sundance. The, the uh, 
traditional, original way of our sun dance. So I sun dance twice a year now. But during our sun dance, I uh, paint my I painted my face black for one of these ceremonies I did when I returned. And uh, from my understanding, and what that does is in the spirit world, these ghosts that I talk about, when you paint your face black, that those ghosts can't find you. They lose you. And they wander off somewhere else. So for one day during Inipi, or uh, Sundance, excuse me, I painted my face black. I've done it several times, actually, because they find you again. They come back, and I don't know how they do it, but they do. And maybe three times I've done it over the last eight years. And I've always noticed when I start hearing them around, or start feeling them around, that I start getting really depressed. The dreams come back, the nightmares, things I've never done in war, I'm dreaming about. I've never killed anybody. I'm dreaming about killing people. So, in our uh, beliefs, these ghosts have that power to give you these crazy dreams. One dream is fine. I could live with one dream. Two dreams, maybe I could live with two dreams. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It starts to get a little much for the human mind to be able to handle. And that's when it starts to drive you crazy. Not the first dream or second dream. When it starts getting 30, 40, 50, 60 every night, every other night. It starts bothering you and it starts hitting your spirit. You can feel it. One of my aunties told me, came to me. I was visiting with her and she said, Oh yeah, I had this dream about you. There was this man standing over you and you were sitting on a bench. And you were plugging your ears. And he was saying, I can't take it anymore, I can't take it anymore. But this man, he said he was dressed funny. He, he had this long dress on, like a big t-shirt. And he was standing over, here, over you and he was saying, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you. And she said, I came up to you and I sat down beside you. And I told you, paint your feet red. Paint your feet red and you won't be able to find you. So, for the past two years during Sundance, I've been painting my feet red. So, you know, what, how they find us, how these ghosts find us, but is beyond me. But it must have something to do with what comes out of our bodies and the trails we leave, the spiritual trails. But that man, I thought about it, man with the dress, you know, long t-shirt, what, what is he, what is she talking about? And then I started remembering, go back to some of those pictures, go back to the picture of that boy. The one standing beside me. There's a guy behind us, behind me. He has a long t-shirt. Or dress, as she said. This boy too. Can't see the bottom. So in this dream, my Tuween was telling me that one of these guys followed me back from war. And he was driving me crazy. And he was. I didn't know what he was doing, but I could feel my mind wasn't right. So these ceremonies that we do are very powerful to uh, lose some of these things. Sundance, I painted my face black. And I also made all these items. I talked to my uh, Auntie Rick when I first returned, and he said, you, there was four ceremonies that all our warriors went through when they come, from, come back from battle. And you have to go through these four ceremonies. And what their names are, I can't remember right now, but I'll tell you what I do remember. Um, 
he said, you have to do this, you have to make this, and you have to, you have to make a staff with uh, painted red and put, uh, was it, four, four pieces of horse hair on it. And he asked the Sundance, with this you have to make a crown and have feathers going up and you have to make a sunflower medallion. And, and I'm like, whoa. And he spit it all out like two minutes. And so I did what I remembered in those first, right away I did what I remembered that first year. I couldn't remember all the other stuff and I never asked what the other stuff was. Another two years passed and I almost joined the military again. I almost re-enlisted. And then my mind was, I gotta go back to war. I gotta go back to war. It just kept saying that over and over. I wanted to be over there. I wanted to be, I hated the army, but I loved being in war. Because war is real. Dealing with death and, and uh, all the scary stuff that happens over there, that's real. Being in Hawaii, stationed in Hawaii where I was, was we had to pretend all the time. You always had to salute officer because you have to look out for snipers. You always have to be aware of your surroundings. You know, pretending, I hated the pretending part. I loved being in the war. So I was always trying to go back. In those two years, I got that first, those first two ceremonies done. I was trying to re-enlist. I was talking to a recruiter. Almost went back. Um, then my dad, Mitch, walking out, I was telling him, you know, I think I'm going to go back, I'm going to re-enlist. He said, leave those people alone. I didn't think of it like that. I wasn't thinking about bothering people. I was just thinking about going to war. So then I started putting more thought into it. And I talked to my other dad, Warren. Told him about the ceremonies that I was supposed to do, and I didn't do them. He said, just pray about it. They'll come back to you. So I started doing it. I started praying about it. Praying about remembering those ceremonies. And I remembered them. I started making the medallion of the sunflower. I made my staff. Painted it red, like I was told. Put four little bundles of horse hair on it. They represent scalps. The red represents being the warrior, have, having gone to war. I've done that. I've sun danced with you know, the, the feathers in my sun dance, in my sage crown. Um, I went on a hill with these items too, several times. For Humbletia, for a vision quest. So these are all things that I've gone through. But what I noticed happened when I got those last two ceremonies done. And each one of those things I just described is a little ceremony. But when I got them, them done, my mind calmed down. I just like, I totally relaxed. I didn't want to go to war anymore. I just wanted to be with my kids. And I see that now a lot of our veterans... Are they going back to Iraq, Afghanistan two, three, four times? Um, uh, being having gone through what I've gone through, I understand why they go back, and I don't admire them because they're going to live with this stuff at one point. Right now, maybe they're burying it. It might come out, and when they get out, it might come out next year. It might come out forty years from now. What really pushed me to get those last two ceremonies done is I ran into my uncle, Bern, uh, Bern Stans, who's a Vietnam veteran in Hot Springs. Hey, what are you doing over here? He said, I moved up here to be close to the VA. He said, one day, you know, this is 40 years after the Vietnam War. He said, one day, I remembered the things I did in Vietnam, and I put my head on my mom's lap, and I just cried. And I couldn't stop crying. I didn't want that to be me 40 years from now, 30 years from now. So I started thinking about those last two ceremonies. I better get them done. So I did. But uh, all these ceremonies are something that our veterans should be going through. 
Um, maybe they don't sun dance, maybe they don't hold a pipe, but if they want to live with this, and they want to fight this, because it's a battle, every day is a battle, a silent battle within yourself, then they have to go through these things. They have to endure it, they have to want it, they have to want to be healed. And if they don't, they probably never will, because it's a lifelong battle. I asked the grandfathers a sp special time last year, December 21st. It was a special alignment in a Lakota constellation that I learned from Ate, right? And he said, if you, if you lay down and you just relax and pray for the certain time that you're going uh, to have some insight that you will never have again for 20,000 years. So I did. And I was laying there and I was asking about this, this pain. They asked when it's going to go away. And they said, when you're an old man. So this is a battle. Everyone, every veteran is going to go through for their life. It's not going to end. The ceremonies didn't heal me. They started the process. The rest, uh, Inipi, throughout my life, Lawampi, it's all maintenance. You know, it's, it's just maintenance to maintain what the ceremonies start. But you have to start somewhere, and that's what these ceremonies do. Thank you, that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Jack, you said that the VA wanted to give you drugs, but not really appreciate Yeah, the VA, I've been going to the VA, I still go to the VA. The VA gives you drugs on drugs and on drugs. You know, I have duck, and this bothers me. Here's, here's some meds. Um, all they do is talk to you, they put you in a group, let you talk to other veterans, and then they'll give you drugs. Drugs for the voices, drugs for not being able to sleep, drugs for this, drugs for that. Um, I haven't taken the drugs. They give them to me, I don't take them. I go to the ceremonies. That helps me. I've never gone to the PTSD program. I tried um, with kids and family and being, you know, supporting the kids and family. I can never find the time. Um, but I've been tested for all sorts of stuff with them, you know, mental, psychological testing. And, um, the only thing they have done, they gave me one piece of good advice that I wish they told me in the beginning. They told me, after seeing them for seven years, did you know that exercising an hour per day can replace all psych meds? Like, what? I've been coming to you for seven years now, and you just told me that? And I'm about 100 pounds overweight now. <laughs> I did a practicum at Altering the PTSD program. While I had clients come, and they were doing the same thing. Try not to diagnose veterans as much as possible. Try to not put them into the system. And this means this the civility ratings which means a thousand, two thousand of them in one lifetime to look at the cost of their own government. So they like to try not to do that people. They gave me the diagnosis right away. Okay. Right, as soon as I got back two thousand six, I started seeing a psychologist in the Pine Ridge VA. And they just Diagnosed me right away. I've never sought. Well, actually, I did. I applied for benefits, but I've never filled out the paperwork, so I got denied. Um, somebody filled out the paperwork for me, one of the VA reps. But I don't know. I just can't find it in me to to put in the paperwork benefits. Any other questions? It's about lunch time, so. Thank you.
First of all, I'd like to extend my thanks to Owen for doing this. How many of you got reminded of somebody in your family that never dealt with what they brought home from the war? We had dads, about uncles, brothers, yes. And it's, it, this is a really wonderful part of the presentation to remind us that there are still people in our community who are still lingering from the effects of war. These are wars that have long gone, and many of our relatives have gone to their graves with that pain. How many of you know that? You know, and how many of you at least heard some stories from your uncles and your dad about things that they saw? And so I just wanted to thank you. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, she, uh, she's here. Do you need to ask me? Okay, um, um, we're pretty much drawing to the end of our um, conference here. And it's really, I'm really happy to see, I've been to other conferences where you see people, and each day it starts to dwindle down to less and less. But what I'm really happy about seeing this is that there really hasn't happened here. And, I'm, and I'd like to think that it's because people like Oi, my nephew here, they hold your attention. And the kind of things that he speaks of, it brings all these wounds and opens it back up. So it, it's like an open wound. And with any wound, if you don't treat this wound, it can fester. So because he did this in the spiritual sense, he has a spiritual opening, a spiritual wound. And so we would like to um, have my relative Ben here um, pray with him, and purify him, 